This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. With so much going on in life, sometimes we put ourselves last, and that can take its toll. Visit betterhelp.com super and make your happiness a priority. Hey. Hey. We're back. We're back. Wow. We, we are insane. back. Hey, brother. And welcome, everyone, to our full spoiler review of Thor Love and Thunder, where we're going to try and figure out if this was indeed Love and Thunder or Love and Blunder. <gasps> Whoa. How long have you been working on that? <laughs> like, since I saw the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can't wait to say that. <laughs> All right, let's dive right on in. Hey, Thor, Love and Thunder is like Taika Waititi's rom-com about 80s Thor's self-discovery. She, yeah, basically. Yeah. God, I hadn't even classified it as a rom-com in my head, but you're right. I feel very like, much is. I feel like almost more so than Multiverse of Madness was a horror flick. Yeah. I feel like this was a rom-com. Well, it was sort of like rom-com meets that like very 80s adventure, like cheese, like labyrinth, Goonies sure. sort of style. Like, che- I felt, I felt like they were not afraid to get like deep in the cheese at well, times. Yes. Okay. And so my my absolute and immediate first thoughts as I was like kind of taking it in for the first time was I was like, man, they have not held back from just like really, yeah, like really going for it, really getting like into the humor angle of yeah. it, not taking itself too seriously. And I remember the first time that I watched Thor Ragnarok, also directed by Taika Waititi. And I remember thinking like, did they do too much? Like, is it too funny to where like, it loses some of like what it needs to be in terms of like, you know, like a superhero movie or whatever. Right. And ultimately like my relationship with Thor Ragnarok has done nothing but like gone up since I have, watched it more times okay. like the humor has absolutely like hit me mm-hmm. you know like i think it's hysterical like you know, he's a friend from work yeah. oh i love yeah it's still uh, funny it's still I, funny it is <laughs> um and so as i as i was like wading into this movie i was like they are definitely as Taika Waititi has continued <coughs> to prove himself uh at disney both through you know the mcu projects that he's done through the star wars projects that he's done they're definitely giving him way more reign to like bring his humor and, and really like like what you end up with is now something that probably we wouldn't have been able to call for a long time is like a Taika Waititi movie. That is exactly how I felt about it. Whereas like Thor Ragnarok was just like, we want you to direct Thor Ragnarok. And he's like, I'm gonna make it really fun. And they're like, it is Thor Ragnarok, you can make it funny. And then this was, this was almost just like, Taika, we want you to make a Taika movie. Also, Thor will be in it. Thor, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, Th- that is the requirement. Right. Thor will be in it. He will need to fight some people. There will be hammers. Um, can you make us a Taika movie with Thor in it? With Thor in it. Yeah. And that is a, that is effectively what we got. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like nothing, nothing was basically off limits in terms of like where the humor could or would go. Yes. Uh, and so at times it is just outright ridiculous. Yeah. However, the thing that I think that I was trying to like absolutely like give myself a little bit of like patience on is there's whenever you've watched a recent movie, you have recency bias, which typically means that like, you know, if you're if you're watching all the Marvel movies or all of the Pixar movies or, or anything in like a huge franchise, it's not uncommon to think that the most recent one is the best one because yeah. it's the one that you've had the most recent excitement over getting to watch for the first time. Yeah. And so I feel like my brain was like definitely like calibrating a lot with like, like some of this I feel like is maybe like a little bit too much, but then like at times I was like, but I also thought that about Ragnarok and now I love Ragnarok. And so there's there's almost a part of me that's like, I almost need, like I'm almost afraid that like the recency bias is having a very small negative effect on it versus what I think will ultimately go on to be a okay. positive thing. I think I think you might be right. So you saw it yesterday. I saw it right? yesterday. Okay, I saw it on Saturday night. Today is Monday, so yeah. it's been a little bit longer since I saw it. Right. And I would say already a little bit of this, that is happening. Like when I was watching it, I was like, oh no, they lost, like they went too far. They went too far past Ragnarok and now they're 
I don't know. I did they? Is it? Is it as good? Is it? Uh, and like since then, I was I was like in the movie right. I was I felt like I was recalibrating a lot. But like as of like even just this morning, I've been like I really kind of want to go see it again. Like it's starting to grow on me rapidly. Yeah. So as I was writing all my notes uh, through this, so the way that I like whenever I get ready for our review, what I'll do is I will essentially try to like retell the story in my yeah. own words and okay. like go through everything yeah. and just sort of be like, the, the scene opens with blah, 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 blah. You know, and you're like, kind of mm-hmm. like go through the whole thing and un- unpackage it. And um, I, I definitely agree. Like, I definitely think that I was like, man, this is like, there's like a lot of fun stuff in here. Like, I can't wait to see this again. I want to revisit this again. Uh, but the other thing that I will say about this movie is that while it is very funny and is absolutely like leaned on the comic relief end of it, I also cried watching this movie oh. three times. Whoa! Like tears. Wait, walk me through the scenes in which you cried then. Well, so, I, I mean, probably the one that like absolutely hit me the hardest uh, is is at the end where Gore basically like brings back his daughter. Right. And they like have this moment. Love, and he's as like, it were. As it were. Yeah. Having become like a parent in the past year myself, especially being like a parent to a daughter, like a lot of those things were, I mean, they were just hitting me so hard. Yeah. Uh, and so I think a lot of that was extremely heavy. And on top of that, a lot of the the struggles that you're watching within this movie are very, like they are not superhero struggles. They are real human struggles. They are like dealing with themes of like depression and sickness and loss. Yeah. And it's like, you have all these super powered characters and every single one of them is dealing with something that like any mortal human anybody watching this video could have struggled with themselves. Yeah, for sure. And so that was, I think, part of like, as I was watching it play out, I was almost like, some of this stuff is so real that it almost feels like the only way that you can get within 10 feet of some of these topics in the way that they are (coughs) is by by balancing it so much with on the, the humor, with the humor. Yeah, I think specifically Jane, Thor, Valkyrie, and then Gore all are sort of dealing with this like loss lost love situation in some capacity. Yes. Whether it's like Valkyrie and her loss of like her like sisterhood, Thor and Jane over the lost love of each other, and then Gore over like his daughter. So right. it's like, it's a lot of different kinds of love floating out around there, but all of them are like, feel completely lost. And like, they have nothing to feel without like the love in their life. They've all sort of decided like that's the better way to be. Like because I because like it, I could get hurt again. But then like almost all of them also discover like it basically what Quill of all people says I, at the that, very that was, beginning. Yeah, if, there, if there's anything that is the most shocking thing yeah. about Thor Love and Thunder, it is the fact that Peter Quill had like possibly just good quality advice, right, like, sentiment expressed. <laughs> it was very weird that Star-Lord is the one to kind of deliver the thesis at the beginning of the movie. Right. Like, right. it's better to feel crappy than to not feel anything. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, that, and then basically, with that, you pretty much watch the story, I guess, like begin to unfold right. a bit, um, which is to say that like you start with the Guardians, which I, I almost felt like him starting with the Guardians was good because you had the like that Peter Quill moment. It kind of like sets up the the theme for the rest of yeah. it. However, the fact that they brought in all of those actors, all of the Guardians to be to play the role that they pl- played in this movie, it was I pretty was, small. I was like. I don't, strictly speaking, I don't even know if that was necessary. I don't, like, it was like it they was left us in Endgame with the Asgardians of the galaxy, and yeah. then and then it's like, well, yeah, it's like they wrote themselves into that, and I was like, there is literally no way we can't address that Thor left Endgame with the Guardians, so we will have to go there. I just can't quite figure out why he had to leave. Why, why, why he left with the Guardians at the end of Endgame w- without more of a plan as to where that was going to go. Don't know. Um, however, maybe maybe we'll see in Guardians Volume 3. Maybe they'll like flashback to when Thor was there some. Or like maybe it play, plays a bigger <coughs> role. Maybe it plays a bigger role. Or I don't know. Maybe it was just like a Thor's feeling lost and he's going to go find himself with the Guardians. I thought another thing I really liked about um, Peter Quill's character in this is when Thor is like meditating under the tree 
and they come back or they come find him and they're like, we need your help to win this battle or whatever. Yes. <laughs> and like, he comes down there and he's like giving the whole speech and like, they cut away to Quill and like, I super duper thought they were gonna give him this like eye roll moment of just like, oh my God, this is so annoying, like stop. And he's just like, but he's not, he's like excited about Thor being there. Sure. He's like, here it comes. And he's like, I, yeah, this is about to be on, you know? Right, right. I was like, it was, it very much reminded me of when Cap pulls the hammer and, and Thor is just like, I knew it. It's like, I that is that's so one of my favorite moments in all of Marvel. Cause it's like, Thor's so happy that Steve can pull the hammer. That's not how you think he's gonna react. I know, and, and that is, that. yeah, I, I absolutely yeah. agree. We don't have to spend too much time, no. time on Endgame, but like, I, you're right, because like Cap pulling the hammer is like one of the most remarkable things that happens in all of Marvel ever. Right. But it's, it's almost not even the fact that Cap does it, it is Thor's reaction to him doing it. Yes. And that is what really makes that moment special mm -hmm. to me. So I agree with you, like, it was kind of cool, especially because the last we saw, you know, Star-Lord and Thor, uh, is absolutely that they were kind of having this like, who's the leader? I'm the leader, you're yeah. the leader. Like wink, wink, you yeah. know? Uh, so th that's cool. And it goes to show uh, like th that despite Thor's like lostedness, he's still just like very capable in battle. Right. You know, it's like he, I don't even know if he's like phoning it in. I, I never really, like I couldn't figure out how to quite describe the way that he has this almost like half-hearted, but still very capable heroic nature, but maybe, maybe that is a part of it because then I think throughout a lot of the rest of the movie, he keeps trying to give these like inspirational like speeches and like, you know, speak from the heart and like be the leader and the hero. And he's like terrible at yeah. it, you know? And he's, <laughs> he's like, like, he gets like 90% of the way there. Yeah, and then just know? keeps like, he keeps, yeah. Tripping at the finish line, which yeah. I, I think there's there's a chance that with that, I mean, part of what I think you're seeing <laughs> Never is, meet your heroes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> Um, but he, yeah, he's, Thor can be the superhero, but he can't be like the leader as a superhero that he is accustomed to being because he is still struggling with this like loss of sense of self yeah. within or whatever. And then sort of throughout the movie, you kind of keep see him continuously struggle to like give one of these speeches or like reassure the children when he like arrives or, yeah. you know, whatever, <laughs> like give a pep talk to, to his team uh, until the end when he finally does kind of like pull it all together. And he has like a really cool moment where he like gives all the kids the power of the Lord <laughs> temporarily. <laughs> uh, temporarily from the time. <laughs> yeah. For, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but the, the one thing I would say about that, because I think it is an interesting way to paint that art, but then you also have Jane Foster arrive on scene, who has now got the powers of Thor, who is doing this other thing where she is like struggling to come up with like the hero catchphrases. Right, she's like, oh, I have the, all these amazing powers. And she's like actually good at the fighting and stuff, but she's like, I don't quite know how to like do the superhero thing. Like how to say the right <laughs> yeah, words. Yeah, how to say the right things. Yeah, it, yeah. It, which is kind of funny because it's almost like, you know, granted the powers of Thor, it's like, yes, you are that, like, like that is what comes with that. Right, like, but like, what does it mean to be Thor? Right, right. 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 I couldn't quite tell if I felt like the waters were just muddied because of the fact that she's struggling with like a catchphrase from like a comic relief standpoint. And Thor is like struggling to like speak outwardly the heroicism that is like inside of him. Right. Sort of until the end. So that they felt like like one arm sort of tied behind his back. I, th I mean, it's just examining the, like, what does it mean to be Thor? You know, either way, like Thor, who is Thor, doesn't know what it means to be Thor. And Jane, from the outsider's perspective, doesn't know what it means to be Thor. That's true. You know. That's true. Yeah, so yeah. like, oh, now I am Thor. And then what does that, well, I still don't know what that means. You know? Right. I guess I've got a lot of power and I can shoot lightning and stuff. Eat my hammer. <laughs> <laughs> she finally got it. I know. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah. yeah. It was very fun. Although at the end though, she, is it supposed to be the case? Like she like whispers to him, like she's like, I finally thought of my catchphrase and she like whispers it to him. Yeah. Is it just eat my hammer? Or <laughs> did she then come up with something <laughs> else? I was like, like, I know. I was like, well, why does she have to whisper it? Cause we all just heard her say it. Right. Yeah. Or did she come up and he, cause he laughs and he's like, it's perfect or whatever. So. I don't know. I thought I thought she must have just said like, as, this is like a funny moment. Like I'm dying. Want to hear my catchphrase? Eat my hammer. And it's right. Like, <laughs> you guys, this is perfect. This is, this is great. So I will say that I thought the. I, I mean, I liked lots of parts of the movie. I think the best parts were all. This is like a very like um, uh, Newton Tina situation 
where I oh, feel sure. like the best part of the Fantastic Beast movies is just when Newt and Tina are on screen together. And yeah. I felt like this very same thing was true with um, Thor and Jane. It was like the best parts are just when they're talking. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I would definitely agree with that. And I, and I do think, you know, again, you've got two characters who are both having like their own struggles and, and they both, I was glad that it wasn't the case that they had it so that Jane was sort of like aloof towards Thor. Like it almost seemed like, like they both wanted the relationship back. Yeah. You know, and but it was almost like they were both like a little bit too hesitant to like move in right. on, on that thought for a while. Uh, which again, obviously the other big thing that is going on in terms of like a personal trauma is that Jane is of course dealing with stage four cancer. Right, like you she's know. dying. Right, so now now you've also got this other situation where it's like, you know, even it, like, so she's hesitant to come forth and, and present any of this stuff because it's also like, well, I'm, I'm like not doing so good. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think that the, I, the their relationship, the way that they were sort of like working through everything was, was like adorable and fun and cute. Uh, one of the things about that though, is that I, I couldn't tell if it was distracting that Thor was also having like a mourning or this jealousy about Mjolnir. Mm -hmm. Did you have that feeling at all? Like <laughs> the like Jane returns and it's like, he's supposed to love Jane. It's like, he's like, what he's really struggling with is Mjolnir. <laughs> like <laughs> it was, yeah. The I thought it was very funny the way they made the hammers act like scorned lovers or something. Yes. And like Stormbreaker keeps like creeping up on it. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. hey bro, I'm still right here. Right, 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 right. Yes. I was like, I that they just never have given the hammers themselves that much personality uh, before. And it felt like part of it, it seemed like, like I didn't like, I didn't love the fact that because Thor felt jealous over Mjolnir, like all of a sudden Stormbreaker's Bifrost ability needed like this goat boat situation to move around. It's like, I get why you're doing that. So we can have some like cool rides on the boat and we can use the goats and it's fun, it's fine. Whatever, I just don't feel like that's how the hammers would actually act. <laughs> sure, <Yeah. laughs> sure. It, <laughs> it felt really like petty. they went to uh, extraordinary lengths to find a way to make sure that the goats were pulling <laughs> the swigging ship what, from what? amusement park Asgard. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think of the goats? I actually thought the goats were annoying. Yeah. Um, I, I was walking out of the theater and I was listening to the family in front of me, which had some children in it. And they were um, talking with each other and they're like, what was your favorite part? And like one of the kids was like, everything with the goats. And I was like, this is totally one of those things where it could just be that like it's a lighter version of comedy or something or comic relief. It, it was a lot of goat screaming. Well, like, yeah, it, it, to me, it's like, the goat screaming, I think by the end, it's kind of won me over. It's like, okay, it's funny. But like, it took a while for it to get there because like the the screaming goat thing is very much like a 2005 internet meme. Yeah. You know, it felt like, it felt like for a second, I was like, it, it felt like when you're watching Ralph breaks the internet or whatever, and Ralph is going viral and making all these like old memes. And it's like, oh yeah, I remember all those old memes. And it's like, but those are really old and probably wouldn't actually make someone go viral today. Sure. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, so it's like, are you, <clears throat> are you just leaning on the fact that people will remember the goats and be like, oh yeah, screaming goat memes, or does it feel dated? Or is it like, no, no. Goats were funny in 2005. Everyone forgot about it. Now I'm bringing it back. And I don't know what the answer is. Uh, that, um, I mean, that's <laughs> fine. But the, the other thing too about this though, is that you're talking about a film that has obvious, extremely like deep 80s references. Yeah. And then like the goat thing is, is again, it's like a 2005 meme. So it's like, it's like, it almost doesn't even fit with the, the like, other time-based setting of the film. That's true too, right? You know, it's, it's kind like, of like it's it's like if this was a if this was supposed to be like from the early two thousands, it's like that's a perfect thing to include, right? But that's not the vibe that that it has otherwise. It's it's all otherwise through and through. Yeah, eighties, eighties stuff. Um, which I felt like this is okay. I felt I had this prop not not problem. I had this concern with Multiverse of Madness, where at times feels like such a tribute to the horror genre until like the third act where suddenly it feels like an absolute parody of the horror genre. Sure. And it's just like, 
I, I feel like with this this movie had that same problem at times. You're like, at some points, it felt like, yes, we're paying tribute and lots of homage to like 80s cliches and stuff. But then sure. at some points, it's like, are you making fun of it? Or are you honoring it? Like, I don't know. I feel like it very much turned that line oh, at times. Like, wh- which which direction have they ultimately, like, yeah. really, really taken with it? Yeah, and, and I agree. I agree. Um, and I, I have to say, like, yeah, with the Multiverse of Madness thing, I feel like I have heard completely two ends of the spectrum, which is basically people who love Sam Raimi and think that, like, everything to do with it was absolutely, like, perfect and amazing. Yeah. Um, and then, I don't know, like, maybe, may, not that I don't, appreciate the original like uh like you know spider-man films or whatever yeah but like the i think some of it was just like lost on me and i felt like a little bit like left out of oh right like i know you're making a reference but i don't know what it is yeah exactly and and so i've i've wondered a lot about this because like the referential humor that is happening right now in like you know pop culture media is everywhere yeah like the entire you know spider-man movie is nothing but like referential moments yeah and so this is like one of those things where I was like, how much does it require? Like, do you love referential humor when you get it? Yeah. And then you find it very annoying if you don't get it. Right. Um, and that's like one of those odd, like, I, I, it's a fine this line is, to this walk. Is what I'm saying with the goats. Like, are, is it supposed to be reminding you of the old meme? Like, or is it just like screaming goats are just funny no matter what? Right. I mean, it's an odd behavior for an animal, for sure. To it just is. Have they're just, mean, yeah. They're giant and they're very silly looking. And Thor and Korg are just acting like they're so beautiful. <laughs> I think that's like, the, that was what funnier to me that they're like, <laughs> they're clearly being like foisted onto them. And they're yes. just like, this is amazing. Thank you so much. And they're like, yeah, no, you agreed to take these and you will. <laughs> yeah. Because you destroyed our tower. I don't want to talk about it. It's making me mad. God of destruction. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So anyway, we'll, we'll back up a little bit. So Thor does save the day in the beginning when he's still with the Guardians of the Galaxy. However, he does destroy the thing that they are then trying to protect uh, right. from the army of owls. Um, <laughs> yeah. The I, I was having a hard time even reading that situation with the the like inhabitants of this planet where they seem grateful to Thor a little bit. But they also seemed like, could you please leave now? Yeah. Um, and I almost felt like they, th- this was another situation where they couldn't quite decide, like, do they want the, the like, you know, these Aboriginal people to be, like, just annoyed and be like, okay, can you please, like, you're, you're all, like, part of the problem now. Like, the owls were occupying our tower, but you destroyed our tower. Yeah. In the process of <clears throat> saving it. Uh, but they, they seemed, like, simultaneously grateful and annoyed. And I was like, I feel like you needed to pick one. Yeah, um, it was a little tricky because they definitely were like when he shows up, they're like, yes, awesome. And then he like knocks everyone down and they're great. And they're like, you did, I guess, ultimately solve our problem. Please leave. <laughs> right. right yeah. 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 Uh, moving on from that, we haven't even talked about Gore yet. Oh, you're right. Um, G- Gore the God Butcher. Gore the God Butcher. Played by uh, Christian Bale, Bale who uh, I actually think crushed it pretty much. I, I mean, thought he did great. It looked like he was having a blast the whole time. I, I think, yeah. I mean, it, that being said, there, there's a couple of elements about it that I that I was sort of, that I want to talk about. Okay. Um, one of which is that Gore was great and not in it as much as I expected him to be. Yeah. Um, like, if anything, I almost feel like Gore as a villain was more a, like, vehicle for the plot to move forward. That for sure. Than he really was even, like, this iconic adversary. Yeah. Um, and it, I suppose the other kind of interesting thing about him is that he introduced this, um, what is it called? The the place that he's trying to get through the whole time. Eternity. Eternity. Right? Yeah. Uh, where there is apparently like this wishing well that has like sort of like this, it has like the power that supposedly nothing ever has the power to do. Right. Uh, which it, it, can, like... it can effectively accomplish anything well yeah and it's like i couldn't tell and who knows if they'll revisit eternity at some point in a future movie it seems like they did establish it but the the rules seem to be that the first person to reach eternity would get their wish granted right so it's not like anyone who finds eternity will get their wish granted it was like the was it just the one Right. Or will they be able to plead with eternity at a later point? Because it felt like they might have just introduced like the infinity gauntlet for like, maybe this will be like the eternity saga or something. Sure. You know, like yeah. someone will try and kill eternity or control eternity. That's, I mean, that sounds 
like a, a, a sentence that would exist in Marvel. Because like this, th this what we saw was it was pretty powerful because Eternity effectively reversed death. Like it, yeah, brought which, back the little girl, Love, I guess that's her name, right? Is that what you? But uh, that, that is what my, that, my takeaway is. Yeah, that's what I thought her name was, was Love. Yeah. But um, so, but like um, the Infinity Gauntlet couldn't do that. Right. You know, like um, Hulk tries to bring uh, Natalie back, right? Is that the right name? Natasha. Natasha. Wow. Natasha back. Wow. wow Natalie wow. Rushman. It's Iron Man 2 one. Look you at that. You, you were just making a reference. Making a ref reference. Look. Here we all. Uh. Yeah. Natasha tries to bring Natasha back and it doesn't work. Right. So like that, even with otherwise the most powerful thing in the, I don't know, multiverse, they couldn't do it. Uh, but this being could bring someone back to life. And that, I would say that this is a trope that goes far beyond the MCU. I mean, like even like within like the, the Harry Potter world, it's like the resurrection stone. It's like, it can sort of bring back death. Not really, but like kind of. Yeah. But, but not really. No, really. It's like, it's this is like the ultimate limitation of all things all the time and always. Genie and Aladdin can't yeah. bring back the dead. Right. I can't bring people back from the dead. It's not a pretty picture. I don't like doing it. Over and over and over again, this is like the big no-no wish right. that that can be granted and yet eternity can do it can do it and so what's what's kind of shocking about that though too is that in the end that's what we see it do but the other option was to basically like eliminate all gods and it was fascinating to me how i was actually like i respected that gore's wish felt just as unlikely as eliminating all gods yeah bringing back one little girl <clears throat> from the dead seemed like whoa like that's that's power. Yeah. Like it's a it was an odd way to demonstrate power to me, but I, but it like it hit me. I felt like I felt it. Yeah. I for understood sure. like what that meant about like this entity is like okay, <laughs> okay. This is like the the cheat code. Yeah. Uh, to to all things. Well, so the other weird thing about Gore throughout the movie, as like a as like a villain, is that it he had like this weird irony about his like motivations or whatever. Okay. Because on the one hand, like. They go and visit Omnipotent City or whatever, and Gore is just basically right. The gods are awful. They are well. The, the irony is that like he is like gaining notoriety by killing some of the gods. Like that's right. what gets Thor's attention, right? But the weird thing is the ones he kills were actually the ones who were doing their job for the most part. All the ones who aren't doing their job are hiding in the city. Right. Not Those are the ones he actually wants to kill. The ones he's killing are the ones who aren't skirting their responsibilities. Right. So. Uh, Cause even, yeah, like the giant like dragon thing that he destroys, which is like the exact frame from the comic yes. book. Yes. Which is pretty cool. That was a neat yeah, reference. Yeah, that was a good one. But like even Thor says like, nicest god you'll ever meet. Yeah. You know, and I was like, which I also love because it's like you see this giant like beastly monster laying dead. And it's yeah, like, it's like the last thing in the world you think is that nicest, nicest god. Nicest god, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, um, but no, it's true. So that was going to be like my big question about um, a lot of the underlying like themes of the plot, especially from Gore's perspective, is that like he has this absolute like tragic life. You know, he's trying to like maintain like this this faith in the gods and that like they will do good like when the time is right and everything. Uh, and ultimately just like, it's broken, you know? It's like, he's like, they're, they're not good. And it's because like the God he meets before him is just awful. Right. You know, it's like, it's like, I'm not really rooting for the God in that situation. Like he, he didn't seem like a good guy. Right. It's like Thanos in that you can understand like the motivations. Yeah. You, you can sort of get like at the very least how this particular entity came to view the, the universe, the galaxy, all of existence in the way that that he has they also sort of tied his like evilness to the existence of the necro sword a little bit i understand like they had to like push the fast forward button on gore's like backstory and development and stuff and they're like okay look this guy was super loyal and then he picked up the sword and right at the time he was turning and then they, it corrupted him and like you know he became a sith lord. and then he became a sith lord because like he he goes from being like so righteous so faithful to like i'm gonna kill everyone in like 10 seconds. But uh, <laughs> on the flip end then, uh, I, I think of that is also, it's like, you wonder how much of it was the Necro Sword sort of acting through gore. Yeah. Like, is gore the villain or is the Necro Sword the villain? I think that's true, yeah. Because like, not, I don't know if like redemption is the right word for, for gore, but like, 
as quickly as he went evil is almost as quickly as he like 180s at the end after right. the Necro Sword is then destroyed. Because, you know, I, and I liked the way that once they all, like once uh, Jane, Thor, and Gore reach eternity, and it's like, Gore's basically standing standing in the spot. Like there's not really a whole lot of like stopping him. And so basically Thor's whole thing is like, I'm not even gonna try. Like if I'm about to be like destroyed, then I'm going to like spend the last moments of my existence. Right, with, with the, the person, person that I, I love. love. Yeah. Um, and this was, I thought that was an incredibly unique and sweet way to have like a hero land his finishing blow, so to speak, because it was through inaction, yeah. so to speak. Um, it was also interesting that like Gore has done all of this to like kill the, kill all the gods, get rid of all of them or whatever. But then he gets to Eternity and he's like kneeling before Eternity. Oh, like, sure. Like he's still yeah. treating Eternity as if it's like a god. Right. <laughs> Which just, I guess it is. Yeah, I mean. So yeah. may, maybe from his perspective, what really happened was the gods were then humanized and Eternity became the new. Sure. Right. So it's like you just, you, you wanted to kill all the gods, but you were still like trying to reach one in a sense. Yeah. It was more of like a cosmic entity rather, or maybe more than like a, a, a god. I, I don't know. Marvel plays fast and loose with the term god for sure. They, well, they absolutely do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, even ent or cosmic entity for that matter. Yeah, I mean, right. You've got Eternals and then who created the Eternals? What are their, those are like the- Oh gosh, yeah. What are they? The um, Celestials. The Celestials. Yeah, who were at Omnipotent City. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so they're there. And then you've got all the occupants of Omnipotent City. And then you've got, was that, oh man, I'm sorry, I'm just realizing. There was like this big golden dragon thing at Omnipotent City. I'm suddenly wondering if that was gonna be like a Shang-Chi <gasps> Easter egg Ooh, sort of thing. It does be. feel like it, it does feel all that of a way. sudden. Yeah. Okay, I anyway. wondered about the gold dragon. Yeah, I was like, they got a nice glamour shot of that. Also the little bow, <laughs> the god of dumplings. That was adorable. That was adorable. That was adorable. That was adorable. Yeah, yeah. That, that was pretty great. Um, but I, I do feel like, um, yeah, if, if you're gonna try to compare, uh, you know, <coughs> Ragnarok to uh, Love and Thunder, I feel like uh, Russell Crowe's character as Zeus was supposed to sort of be like- Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum, oh yeah. my gosh, yeah. Yeah, I feel, like, I feel like those scenes were supposed to mirror each other a little bit. Like they're both kind of like, when Thor is at like the hands of someone who like runs someplace, yeah. you know? Um, I think Jeff Goldblum was funnier. Um, <laughs> He's just very funny. He is very funny. Yeah, I, so I think that that scene in my mind from Ragnarok played better than, than this scene in Omnipotent City. Wow. Wow, I didn't hear any thunder, but out of your fingers, was that like sp sparkles? Guys, we need to take a brief pause to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Me Undy. Guys, we are in the dog days of summer, which means if you're not heading out to the pool or the lake or the park with your dog, then you're absolutely doing it wrong. Because Me Undies makes comfortable, breathable, and stylish swim and loungewear for not just your family, but also your kids and canines. Personally, for my family at home, we're super into matching swim attire because it's adorable, okay? But even if you don't want to match with anybody else and just choose to go solo, which is also totally fine, there are just so many great styles and offerings from MeUndies. Because the thing is, when you're comfortable and feel good in whatever you're wearing, I think it allows you to just live that much more in the moment, you know? It's like, science or something. And MeUndies has the lightest and most breathable fabrics to keep you cool and comfortable wherever you go. From undies, bralettes, and socks to loungewear and swimwear, you can find something for all of your plans. MeUndies also releases new prints all the time, like their limited edition pride collection. You can match with your partner, friends, or even your dog. Find your ultimate summer comfort in sizes extra small to 4XL. MeUndies also has a great offer for viewers of the show where you can get 15% off your first order. And for a limited time, if you sign up for their free to join MeUndies membership, you get 25% off your first item. So for 15% off your first order, 25% off your first membership item, and with a 100% satisfaction guarantee, head on over to MeUndies.com slash theories. Again, that's going to be MeUndies.com slash theories. Link is in the description description down below. It was interesting to see like the Russell Crowe Zeus character. And th this is yet another moment <clears throat> though for, for Thor where like, you know, he's so down on his luck. He goes to this place. He's so excited to see like his hero come yeah. out who he's like based so much of his own like- God of lightning, God of thunder. <laughs> like God, you know, yeah. God based 
career off of. And it's almost this like, even that, it's like they just can't stop hitting, kicking Thor while he's down. And they cannot. It's like, yeah. it's like oh, on top of everything else, your hero kind of sucks. Kind of sucks. It was very, in- I think that was like another interesting like um, way they were telling this, like the love story though. Cause it's like, you have your, your main people who are all like afraid to love at all or whatever. And then you have these, like all the gods at Omnipotent City where they are all like on a very one-sided um, journey of love where it's like they are loved by thousands and millions of people across the galaxy just for being gods, but they do not love their pe- their subjects right. at all. At all. And it's yeah. like, and it's obviously this is what's corrupted them. And this is sort of what's making Gore right about most of you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, that that starts to paint though the question of like, what, like, what is, what is the underlying theme of like the whole film? Uh, it feels like it was very much like a Love Conquers All sort of situation, doesn't it? it I mean, that, that <laughs> yeah. is a- absolutely where it goes yeah is is like a very like love yeah is like that is like the most important that is the most powerful that yeah yeah but yeah i that i think that was like one of the big things that i was that i was kind of struggling with was sort of like i don't know what thor's relationship with the rest of the gods is like which then if you want to like fast forward to what i thought was one of the most spectacular moments of the entire movie the mid credit scene the mid credit scene, the mid-credit scene best mid credit scene we have seen in a Marvel movie in phase four, bar none. Oh, bar none. Just bar, bar none. none. Bar none. Bar yeah, if you're gonna say, none. I thought you were gonna say in all of Marvel. I mean, I was like, I probably I probably could have even been on board with that. Yeah. You know, but like phase four for sure. Phase four for sure. No doubt about it. So I, if you know us, you know that we love Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. Yes. And in case you didn't know who is playing Hercules, it is none other than Roy Kent. Roy Kent! Oh my gosh. I was like, I I like almost yelled in the theater. I was like, oh, no, they like surprised me so much. No one spoiled that for me. Sorry if we just spoiled it for you. You knew this was a spoiler review. Oh my gosh. I mean, just absolute perfect casting and timing on the Hercules there with Roy Kent. Because like, I've, I've known that Hercules is a character in Marvel in like the comics for a long time, but I've just been very uninterested in that character joining the MCU. Like, yeah, we already have Thor. I don't really care, whatever. Right. But like, like they gave us Roy Kent. And just like right in the middle of season two and three of Ted Lasso, and it's just like, you have you have timed this perfectly. This star cannot be shining brighter. And it's like, and you know that's exactly how he's gonna act. Too. Oh, it's just, just going to yeah. be exactly the same. And that's what you're going to get. And I was just like this. I'm excited now. I, I I'm was excited. E- I was extremely excited. I was so I'm, I'm so excited for like that actor as well to have been given this role. Um, but so this is this is why I brought that up specifically. For one, I loved it. For two, um, it definitely seems like we're going to have like a Thor versus Hercules saga story movie something right. at some point in time. And the the question there will be like what like what is thor's position ideologically speaking as it now pertains to like his relationship with the rest of the gods seems like they're going to be pretty upset with him it it definitely seems like they're going to be pretty upset with him you know after he effectively almost killed zeus i mean yeah boy in front just, of all of them they had two pretty big fake out deaths right there in a row um with, with korg and zeus yes yeah, yeah. it's true um, so yeah, so that that's like one of the big things that I was kind of wondering about because Gore's whole thing, the villain of this movie is he's trying to kill the other gods. And it absolutely seems like the baton is just gonna be passed to Thor to now be facing <clears throat> down the gods. It just seems, I, I would have to imagine that the sort of the trajectory they're on is that Thor will become sort of the new, like he's not king of Asgard, that'll be Valkyrie, but he'll be king of the gods. He might be king of the gods. So he might become like the new Zeus. Right, yeah, yeah. basically at yeah. some point or another. I have a feeling that the Hercules Thor fight will be very civil war as well. It's just like, cause Hercules is I think traditionally a hero in Marvel. So whilst they will have an epic fight, I am sure, I am also sure that eventually they will be on the same side. They'll be buddies. They'll be total buds. That's and great. you'll get to see some, some real Roy Kent, Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, and so here's the other thing too though is uh you've got 
you've got you've got Roy Kent from Ted Lasso, and then in the Spider-Man No Way Home end credit scene, you also had Danny Rojas. Danny Rojas. Yes. Uh, but who possibly is going to be infected by a symbiote? Oh yeah, is he going to be the new Ven- the MCU Venom? Will he, yeah, will he be the MCU Venom? Oh man, which would be fascinating. That would be fascinating. So now I'm also just like, is Jason Sudeikis going to show up as where, an MCU character? Where is Jamie Tart, Ben? <laughs> He's going to get punched by Hercules. <laughs> He's going to. Oh my god, I, yeah. that nothing could make me happier than if they they cast. I, I wish I knew the actors' names. Uh, whoever plays Jamie Tart in MCU for Hercules to punch in the face. That would be amazing. Although it'd be referential humor. It would be referential humor, but it would be the sort of thing where they could pull it off where like, if you know, that's amazing. And if you don't, like whatever, you just punch some pretty boy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, there's that, there's that. But that is the question. That is like what I want to know from everybody is sort of like, I the referential humor thing right now, I feel like is it is it is on the narrowest of lines. It's like, it's either working for you or it's driving you crazy. And I swear, I think that I have talked to so many people who the things that they love about these specific movies are the referential humor moments that they get. And then the moments that they hate are the referential moments that they didn't get. It, it, it's either, it's like, it's either positive payoff or it isn't. And it's such a yeah complicated thing. And it's, I, I don't know why this movie in particular just got me to the point where I was like, we need to make a decision about this. Like we need to know how we how we gonna handle referential humor going forward. Because Well, I think because this one relied so much on like eight like a little bit of like your knowledge of like eighties movies, whereas like you didn't necessarily like maybe with multiverse of madness, you didn't necessarily need to know a ton about every horror movie ever made, just that like, this is a horror movie. Sure. Kind of, I mean, there was some like very specific Sam Raimi stuff in there as well. By the way, the actor who plays Roy Kent is called Brett Goldstein. Brett Goldstein. Brett Goldstein. Yeah. Uh, and then let me, just so we're there, they, uh, Jamie Tart is Phil Dunster. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, they can also include. That'd yeah, be that'd, that'd be great. great. Also, Hannah Waddingham would be a great MCU character. She right? could be she anything. She could be anything. She, I mean, she basically is already a god. Basically I mean, <laughs> already a god. All yeah. right. I'm, I'm all for it. I'm Just all for it. Just give me everyone from Ted Lasso in the MCU and I'm, we're set. We're, set. we're happy. We're I'm happy. happy. They can even just I'm be there. themselves again. Ted Lasso could just be Ted Lasso in the MCU. Oh, It'll be gosh. fine. Can you imagine if that came out? Yeah, Ted Lasso is just actually in the MCU. That would be shocking. Just, just aside from everything else. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so 87 deviations past that. We can also bring ourselves to uh, the end credit scene yes. where we see uh, Jane Foster arrive in Valhalla. Yep. Uh, something that they did, they went to great lengths, I felt like, in the movie to talk about like the specific terms under which you enter Valhalla through. Right, you have to die in battle or whatever. Yeah, it was, those were another, like some of those moments where I was like, this feels like it didn't need to be done. Also, do they recast Lady Civ? Oh, I don't know. It seemed like they kept her face covered. I couldn't tell if that was like, mm. a, like we, we need it to be her, but like the actress didn't want to come back or something. I, um, boy, I don't know. Anyway, okay, not the point. Anyway, so we see that Jane <coughs> Foster does arrive in Valhalla uh, to be greeted by- Heimdall. Heimdall. Uh, and you're like, whoa, that's amazing. Like for one, you know, she was yeah. like a mortal being like three days ago. And now she is in like Norse heaven, yeah. effectively. Good for her, very exciting stuff. Uh, and then Heimdall being back is super exciting because you know, Idris Elba, the, love it. Right, the the real dile- or question it creates is like, they didn't show us Jane and Heimdall in Valhalla because they're not going to be important in some way. Right, you know? Which again, it's kind of like the, it's, it's exactly like I said before, which is that like the return of Gore's daughter was like monumentally huge because it meant that they brought somebody back from the dead. Right. Like using magic or otherwise galactic celestial right. forces of some kind. Suddenly it's just like, where are we? Like, are we going to, you know, you're like, what about Tony? And what about Natasha? Or, and, right. Like, you know. <laughs> is, is it a question of either who's actually gone or are <clears throat> those people also in Valhalla? Oh, mm. I see. It feels like it feels unlikely that Tony Stark would be in Valhalla. I don't think they'd be in Valhalla. No. Uh, but yeah, so the question the question though is But did, I don't think love was in Valhalla. Well, so here's my here's no. my query. Do you think Thor will die? Oh. Because that would be an interesting way to like have Valhalla come back into play at some point in time is is almost more if like now that we know they're there, it's almost like let's forget about that a little bit. Maybe Hercules kills Thor. And it's like what you get though is the moment where he gets to reunite with his best friends. I see. And then Thor gets to like be at peace. Mm -hmm. 
a bit. I think this is like something I'm trying to remember about Norse mythology. Cause I thought like Ragnarok is like the end, is typically like the end event, but it, maybe they're messing with that a little bit more or something. But like, I think all the warriors go to Valhalla so that when Ragnarok happens, they all like get to, they all like fight again or something. So I'm not sure if there will be some sort of catalyst that involves like them getting to fight again. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like that, that that's part of the myth, the mythology of it. I could be totally wrong, but I feel like that's. No, that I, I feel like I feel like I I have. It's almost like they go to Valhalla to like wait await Ragnarok. Yeah, like almost. to await Ragnarok. Yeah, yeah, but obviously they already made Thor Ragnarok. So, but you know, Asgard is a, is a people, not a place. So, which would mean that all the people, all have the to be people gone. have to be gone. <laughs> <laughs> Who's to say that would be quite a that'd be quite an early victory though? If like Hercules kills Thor, I can see something that'd be crazy. Yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty unbelievable. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and then I suppose the other big question would be that like with the idea that now Thor will be returning um, with a sidekick is sort of like, what will her identity yeah. become? Because they sort of show like in her reflection though, it's like she has that sort of like star filled by like, is love really love alive again? Or is it just like, she, uh, is it like eternity walking around? As like an actual embodiment of- Yeah. Of, okay, you that's know? an interesting thought. Because she had powers all of a sudden. Too, you she know? did. Yeah, it's not like she can't. Because I don't. I didn't get the feel. I mean, who knows? But I didn't get the feeling that when she was dying in Gore's arms in the desert, that she was also a superpowered being with like laser eyes and stuff. Well, if she can wield <clears throat> Stormbreaker, then maybe just do powers come with wielding Stormbreaker? Maybe mm, not. But she wasn't holding the hammer when she shot the eyes or anything. Hmm. Okay. And I, I, they. I don't think they've established that you have to be worthy to wield Stormbreaker. Right, no, it doesn't seem like that's been as yeah. much of a problem. Okay, well, yeah. So I mean, I think that'll be that'll be a very curious direction to see that go. And it's just another like sort of inclusion of a younger character who I feel like has got to be orienting towards young Avengers. Young Avengers in some capacity. Yeah, they yeah. got Miss Marvel going on. They got young Hawkeye and Yelena and all these other characters out there. Right, yeah. I mean, even, even you know, Peter Parker is like- Young guy. Y young kid, yeah. Young kid. I mean, so <laughs> I, there's, there's yeah, definitely- Yeah, you're right. They could totally do Peter Parker as the leader of Young Avengers. Yeah. Because like, also, well, no one knows who Peter is anymore. So he'd have, you know, super secret identity again. That's true. Yeah. Kind of mm. useful. Kind of useful, I mean, indeed. A little, little frustrating. Yeah. But, you know. That is, that is the Spider-Man way. Anyway, um, is there anything else we didn't touch on? Um, I wanted to, I maybe mean, we, we sort of flirted around it, but I think I, it's just been interesting um, as of this movie, like the direction it feels like they're going with the phase four movies, okay. more or less. Cause it seems like the past they were doing like, okay, we're gonna have like a Marvel movie, but in this genre kind of thing. Like they maybe I'm almost taking it like one step further to where it's like, it's not like a genre movie. It's like, we're just letting the directors have like free reign over whatever they're doing, but with this character. Like it reminded me a lot of what maybe Star Wars tried to do, like with um, The Force Awakens and then The Last Jedi, yep. where it's like so many people love The Last Jedi is like their favorite Star Wars movie ever. And so many people hate it. It's like the most divisive one ever. And it's like, I think this is just my personal theory, but like at the end of the day, I think what it is is that like The Last Jedi is just like a really awesome Ryan Johnson movie right. that because it is under the Star Wars umbrella is a Star Wars movie. Um, but so, it, it's off-putting because it is stylistically different and it is in the middle of this otherwise very well-established universe and it feels so different from The Force Awakens. And it's like, is it a good standalone movie? Yes, like, is it a great, is it is it a Star Wars movie? Like, uh, only kinda, you know? Sure. And I think it's like, and I think Marvel, on the other hand, is able to get away with this in a way that Star Wars was not because, um, Marvel, like they're not, a lot of the things they're doing in phase four are brand new characters without like established styles. And and they're allowing them. them to exist for the most part within their own small little pocket of like right. time and space with their own little pocket of like, you know, enemies and villains. And it's like, the problem with Star Wars is that like, it's, you've got 
the First Order and Palpatine. And it's like, there's no other way to like get away from it. It's like every story always revolves around the Rebel Alliance versus the Empire or right. the Resistance versus the First Order. Right. You know, like the Jedis are fighting the Sith. Like, right. They're, they're so... They're so interconnected. It's all of Star Wars is like the same big story. It's all, you know, whereas you get elements with the MCU from each story. Like the characters can exit their stories and come together for like the team up, but like their individual standalone stories still work well on their own. Right. Um, and, and, and maybe I think like what they have to do, what the MCU has to do is that everybody was getting st- tired of right. origin stories. Well, they're getting tired of origin stories and it felt like maybe like also like towards the end of phase three, like Marvel, like, I mean, like they had their own like developed, like almost style, like this is a Marvel movie and I know what to expect. But the problem is Star Wars makes like three movies every, you know, 20 years or something. And Marvel makes like three movies every month or something, you know, it feels like, like they churn out so many that it's like easy to start feeling like, okay, I've, I guess I've seen it. Like it's new characters, but it's kind of the same, it's kind of the same thing. So it's like, yeah, you switch the genres, but it's still sort of the same thing. So it's like, on the one hand, how do you break that trend? And this seems to be like what they've decided to do is give way more artistic freedom to the directors. But like, it seems like the pros and cons of it are like, beforehand, like guaranteed, every Marvel movie was gonna fall somewhere nicely between like a, a seven and a nine. You're gonna like it. You're gonna walk out of the theater and be like, yay, Marvel. Right. Did, I did a Marvel, yay. Did Whereas Marvel. now I feel like what they're doing is like the range of your enjoyment is all the way from just one to 10 now. And it's just like, it, you you have the opportunity to walk out of any Marvel movie as your new favorite movie. Right. Because it hit you square in the exactly what you wanted. Right. But at the same time, it can hit you way on the other end too. Right, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's maybe like, Every Marvel movie before was vanilla, and now every movie is like some wacky flavor. Right, and it's like you either—it's either your favorite flavor ever, or you hate it. Right, like (laughs) Um, not everyone likes pistachio ice cream, but some people won't eat anything else. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and so what's interesting about that though is like even like when we were talking just briefly about like Phase Four in the Office here is that everybody has a, a a. different favorite movie from phase four. Yeah. Except in maybe- Well, I don't know, I think me of, and you likes, this is like Spider-Man, or that was what me and you both said was the best yes. thus far. And I feel like Spider-Man though, is the one that felt the most like just a regular Marvel movie. It's like this, they, I feel like they were like putting a bubble around Spider-Man, like Spider-Man will make the Marvel movies and it'll be the Marvel style Marvel movies with Spider-Man. Right. And like, that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> right, yeah, but, but then everything These other else- characters, this is our main guy, okay? Peter Parker will die at the end of phase six. <laughs> <laughs> he will be the next Tony Stark. Do you think he'll snap? I don't think he'll snap. He'll probably just like become eternity for a couple seconds or something. I don't know. Pro- probably. Yeah, something, you know. Something cool. Something like that. Um, anyway, yeah. So that being said though, we need, to, we need to tell them how we felt about this movie. Yeah. Okay. How did you feel about that? Well, okay, so walking out, I was like, oh boy, I feel like I'm down in like the 70s or something, but it's like quickly aged on me fast. So I'm gonna go 84 is oh! my out of 100, I'd say, yeah. Man, we are we are in the exact same territory. Okay. I, I walked out and and I, I, I mean, I laughed out loud, I cried, um, but I also felt like there were elements of the story or like pieces of it that I, I just, I, I want to reserve the right to improve my score as time goes on, as I've mm-hmm. been able to like, you know, spend a little bit more time with it, get a little bit more acclimated to like, you know, what full Taika Waititi looks like and everything. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, that that is exactly what happened with me in Ragnarok. I think originally I was kind of like, I can't tell. And then now it's like, I'll like fall asleep in that movie. It's yeah, like, it's amazing. It's like it's so Tell good. Tell the goat screams. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna fall asleep. To the goat screams, <laughs> I don't think. Um, but so I, m- the number in my head literally was an 83. Wow. I know. Okay, so we're very on the same page. Very on the same page. Four. But I do want to go see it again. Is the uh, other yeah. thing too that I will that I will say. So um, yeah, it does have the rewatch of it. Like I do want to watch it 
again in a way that I didn't feel maybe after like Doctor Strange. Sure. Although certainly Spider Man, I did rewatch that and it was awesome. I guess. So, 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 let me tell you what, Spider Man, still awesome. awesome. <laughs> yeah, definitely cool. the best Phase Four movie thus far. Yeah. But see, this is the other thing is that like I feel like because they can do all these like wacky, they're trying like these very different like styles with everything. I feel like that was a, a real reason like Shang-Chi was able to like super shine through because like Marvel movies at their core will always have like fight scenes and stuff. And like the genre they went with there was like Kung Fu movie, Kung Fu which movie. is just naturally a fighting. It's about fighting. Right. It was like, that works really well right there. Um, it was also just a good movie, but it anyway. was a good movie. It was good. Okay. I, I would say Shang-Chi is up there for- Yeah, for was pretty good. Four. Um, I'll say this, this is the, I just got this joke like three days later and I felt so stupid for it. All right, so at the end, Korg reveals that like, he's like, you know, reformed himself and he's like holding hands with like, uh, like making a little Korg baby or whatever. Yes. Right, with what's the guy's name? Right. No, that was Dwayne. Dwayne. Dwayne, the rock monster. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, uh, I totally no. missed her. I thought it was Brain. I no, was like, Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne the Rock. <laughs> yeah. Like that is absolutely what they were going for there. That is, is. amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. Mm -hmm. Can yes. we just talk about Korg for one second? Okay, I know let's that talk I, about we're Korg. Like, okay, yeah, because we're the there. Korg, I could not figure out how I felt about the Korg hey, face mask. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah, kind of like continuing with them for the rest of the story. It was a little silly. It was a little silly. Yeah. It was a little silly. Um, hey, guys. Uh, like, I love Korg. Yeah. I, like, I, and I think and he's that- played it, by the director. And he's played, yeah, and he's played by the director. And so I think, oh, by the way, kind of just the uh, love at the end is actually Chris Hemsworth's real life daughter. What? Yes. I did not know that. Truth That's fact. cool. Yeah. Okay. And actually cool. Natalie Portman and Christian Bale's Children are also in the horde of Asgardian children. I didn't even know they were married. Or no, not there. Oh, not there. Oh, not there. Oh. No, I'm sorry. Okay. They have. They're not married. Okay. They have their like, own what? children. In, My mind is being in, blown right now. That would be shocking. Sorry. Natalie Portman's children, Comma. and Christian Bale's children. Yes. Are in the Asgardian. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. And Got the it. little boy that is Thor running through the woods in the beginning is also Chris Hemsworth's son. Wow. Yeah. Lots of very fun stuff. I know. There, there were like lots of like little neat, neat nods there. Um, however, yeah. So I loved Korg in Ragnarok. I thought he was amazing. I felt like maybe, maybe there was a little bit of like the Mater effect going on, like from like mm. Cars 2, or it was like, I can't quite tell if they pressed the pedal a little too hard on Korg. Uh -huh. And when, when I thought he was dead, I was like devastated. I was yeah. like, I, there's no way you just killed Korg. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't have. But then when they pick up the mask and it's just his face and it's like, turns mm. out the only living thing in our body is our mouth. It was like, well, well. I was like, maybe you should have died. <laughs> maybe, like, I can't tell if this is better. <laughs> well, this is, that was one of those things like, they, I felt like, yes, it was like, man, maybe they're pressing the pedal a little bit too hard on the Thor, on the on the Korg train here. But then for like the 10 seconds when I thought he was dead, I was like, I see what they did. They had to front load a lot of Korg because he's because they want you to really feel it when he dies. Right. And then it was like, I very much it was that same exact emotional response to when you thought Leia was dead in Star Wars. So I was just like, I can't believe they did it. No, like right. I'm a, like, I'm upset, but I'm impressed. I'm impressed they went for it. I, I can't believe it. Like, you shocked me. Good job. And then I was like, never mind. Forget it. <laughs> never like, mind. Like, had they just straight up killed Korg there, I would have been like, no. I was like, I was as impressed as I was upset. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it was like, dude, Zeus sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> the worst. The dude. <laughs> and then that's exactly how Thor feels. And then you think they kill Zeus. And then it's like, oh, wait, Korg was fine. Maybe we overreacted or something. I don't know. So, um, yeah. But I thought the face was a little cheesy. I guess they sort of did the same thing with Groot for a while, or they've still they've been doing it like they had. You haven't seen Groot at full power since Guardians 1. I know, but, you know. I know, yeah, yeah. It'll be it'll be interesting to see if whenever we get full-size Groot back. Oh yeah, that'd be great. I know. Full Groot again. He's yeah. been a teenager Groot for like a long time yeah, now. For maybe too long. Maybe, maybe too, too long. long. All yeah. right. Anyway. Um, guys, I'm very curious to hear all of your thoughts on Thor, Love and Thunder. I definitely wanna know what your thoughts are on like the referential humor thing, because I do feel like that's becoming like, it's impossible for me to ignore it as like a topic at this point in time, because it has become like, I think between 
Spider-Man, Multiverse of Madness, and now Thor, it's like, it has become such an important aspect of being able to like absolutely appreciate the the work to its fullest. Mm -hmm. And so there's a little bit of that, like with the MCU for the longest time, there was always that question of like, oh, well, do I need to have seen all the other movies first? And, and for the most part, it was always like, no, you don't need to have seen all the other movies first. Um, and it's now it's almost odd because like what you were saying, because the directors are getting so much creative freedom over it, it's almost like, do I need to watch all of, you know, Sam Raimi's work before no. <laughs> going to see Multiverse of Madness in order to understand that Bruce Campbell joke at the end? And it's like, it's sort of a small joke right at the end, but you will only understand it if you've seen his his other movies. Only understand it fully. Otherwise, you're just like, oh, yeah, the, the guy was punching himself. That's funny. It's funny, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, so be sure to let us know all of your thoughts. Uh, let us know what your score was out of 100 or whatever scale that feels appropriate to you. How many hammers out of 11? Yeah, how many know? hammers out of 11 did Thor 4 Love and Thunder get? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, be sure to let us know in the towel section down below. Otherwise, until next time, bye! bye.